Everyone talks about the Megalodon. But what if I told you the oceans were home to even more terrifying giants? Imagine monstrous leviathans with jaws that could crush bone, and bizarre predators that redefined what it meant to be a top-tier hunter. Join us as we dive into the primordial seas to uncover these forgotten titans and the incredible world they dominated. Long before humans ever walked the earth, there was only the ocean. It was a world unto itself, ancient, restless, and unimaginably vast. In that blue wilderness, life experimented, failed, and evolved again, shaping creatures that would make even the legendary Megalodon seem like just one chapter in a much older, wilder story. Today, when people think of sea monsters, they picture the Megalodon. The bus-sized shark, the ultimate apex predator of relatively recent prehistory. Its massive triangular teeth and bone-crushing bite have turned it into a pop culture icon. But Megalodon was not the first giant of the deep. It arrived late in Earth's history. By the time it cruised the Miocene seas, the oceans had already seen empires rise and fall, each ruled by creatures every bit as terrifying and strange. To understand those forgotten titans, we have to leave the age of mammals and sharks and travel unimaginably far into the past, back to a time when even the idea of a fish with jaws was new. Hundreds of millions of years before Megalodon, the oceans were already thick with predators. Some were armored like tanks. Some had sleek, dart-shaped bodies and eyes the size of dinner plates. Others hardly resemble anything alive today. As if evolution itself was in a phase of wild experimentation, trying every possible design for monster to see what worked. The deeper into time we go, the more alien the oceans become. Our journey begins in the Paleozoic era. Over 450 million years ago, when life's first wave of giants rose underwater. On land, almost nothing lived beyond simple plants. But beneath the waves, life was exploding. Shellfish carpeted the seafloor. Trilobites crawled like armored beetles across the mud. And tentacled creatures loomed in the shallows. In this world, the first true giants appeared. Not as fish, but as arthropods distant cousins of modern scorpions and crabs. These were the Eurypterids, the sea scorpions. Some were small, but others became enormous. The most infamous, G. Coleopterus, grew to nearly two and a half meters in length. Imagine a scorpion longer than a human, with broad paddles for swimming, powerful claws for grabbing, and a body plated in rigid armor. It prowled ancient river mouths and coastal shallows, a silent nightmare gliding over rippled sand. Smaller animals, primitive fish and other invertebrates, would have stood no chance once those claws clamped down. For a time, creatures like G. Coleopterus sat at the top of the food chain, ruling the water without rival. As time passed, though, new competitors emerged. Vertebrates, animals with internal skeletons, began to appear. At first, they were small, jawless fish, more like living tubes than real hunters. But slowly, they developed cartilage, bone, and eventually jaws. Once jaws evolved, the rules of the game changed forever. By the Devonian period, often called the Age of Fish, the seas had become an evolutionary battlefield. Some fish wore heavy armor. Others traded defense for speed. Predators and prey spiraled upward in an arms race that drove both complexity and size to new extremes. From this crucible emerged one of the most fearsome killers the ocean has ever produced, Dunkleosteus. If G. Coleopterus was a nightmare scorpion, Dunkleosteus was a swimming fortress. It could reach 9 meters or more, its front half encased in thick bony plates like interlocking shields. Its head looked like the front of an armored vehicle, with eye sockets set in massive skull plates and a jaw unlike anything seen today. 
Instead of separate teeth, Dunkleosteus had sharp-edged bony blades forming a crushing, slicing beak. When it bit down, those blades could chop through armor and bone with incredible force. Even a monster like Dunkleosteus was not invincible. Near the end of the Devonian, a series of environmental crises struck the oceans. Oxygen levels in the water dropped. Habitats shrank. Coral reefs, which had once flourished, collapsed. Whole groups of animals vanished forever. Dunkleosteus and its armored kin disappeared in this mass extinction. Their reign cut short. But evolution doesn't stop, it resets. With each great dying, new opportunities open. Niches once held by giants become empty, waiting to be claimed again. Millions of years later, in a very different world, the seas would be ruled by an entirely new kind of giant. Reptiles, once purely land-dwelling, began returning to the water. At first, they hugged coastlines and marshes. Over time, some of them abandoned the land completely, trading legs for flippers and lungs tuned for deep, prolonged dives. By the time dinosaurs had risen on land, the oceans were already home to their equally impressive relatives. These were the reptiles of the Mesozoic seas, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and mosasaurs. Together, they turned the oceans into arenas of sleek speed, elegant ambush, and overwhelming power. They weren't dinosaurs in the technical sense, but they lived alongside them and rivaled them in size and ferocity. If you were to dive into a Jurassic or Cretaceous ocean, these are the giants you would fear most, long before any shark or whale had evolved. The first of these marine reptiles to truly dominate were the ichthyosaurs, the fish lizards. Evolving from land reptiles, they reshaped themselves into near-perfect swimmers. Their bodies became streamlined, their tails evolved into powerful fins, and their limbs flattened into paddles. They had enormous eyes, some of the largest ever found, suggesting they hunted in deep or dim waters. Unlike their distant ancestors, they gave birth to live young at sea, freeing them from any tie to the land. Among the ichthyosaurs, some species reached staggering sizes. Shaunasaurus could grow over 20 meters long, rivaling modern whales. Imagine a reptilian creature of that size gliding through dark blue water, its skin smooth, its flippers cutting the water with effortless strokes. Around it swirl schools of fish and squid-like animals, the same general roles filled today by tuna and cephalopods. Shaunasaurus likely hunted in deep, open waters, using its size, endurance, and speed to chase down prey over long distances. In many ways, it filled the same ecological niche whales occupy now, proof that the ocean tends to favor certain shapes and strategies, repeating them again and again across time with different kinds of animals. As the Mesozoic progressed, another group of marine reptiles rose to prominence. The plesiosaurs. They were unlike anything alive today. They had broad, rounded bodies and four powerful flippers that beat like underwater wings. Many species had astonishingly long necks topped with relatively small heads. Among the most famous, Elasmosaurus stood out, a reptile more than 14 meters long with a neck that likely exceeded seven meters by itself. That single neck contained dozens of vertebrae, far more than any modern animal. For a long time, artists imagined Elasmosaurus holding its neck straight up, like a swan, or looping it into dramatic curves. Later studies showed its bones did not allow such extreme postures. Instead, its neck likely moved in gentle sweeps, especially side to side, allowing it to probe through schools of fish or ambush prey with minimal disturbance. The body could remain deeper and more hidden, while the head pushed forward into territory the bulkier torso could not reach. In this sense, Elasmosaurus was not just bizarre, it was specialized. Its odd shape was a refined hunting strategy, not a random quirk. Not all plesiosaurs had long necks. 
Some, called pliosaurs, shortened the neck and enlarged the head, turning the same basic body plan into something more like a marine big cat. These forms had massive skulls and jaws full of conical teeth, built to grab and crush large prey. Between the long-necked and short-necked types, plesiosaurs occupied a wide range of niches, preying on fish, squid-like animals, and even other marine reptiles. For tens of millions of years, they shared the seas with ichthyosaurs, thriving wherever warm, shallow oceans spread over the continents. All of these animals, Eurypterids, Dunkleosteus, Ichthyosaurs, Plesiosaurs, Mosasaurs, were giants in their own right. Yet the oceans also held stranger, subtler marvels. They were home to forms that pushed the limits of what a living body could be, not just in size or power, but in shape and function. Consider the ammonites. These were cephalopods, related to modern squids and octopuses, but they lived inside coiled, chambered shells. Some were small, no bigger than a coin, drifting in massive numbers like a living haze. Others grew to over two meters across, with heavy, ridged spirals housing large, muscular animals. Their shells were more than shields. The internal chambers acted as buoyancy controls, letting them adjust their depth by carefully managing gas and fluid. They were among the most successful ocean animals ever, thriving for hundreds of millions of years and surviving multiple past extinctions before finally disappearing with the Mosasaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. Then there is Helicoprian, a creature seemingly designed to confuse. It lived long before the age of dinosaurs, in the late Paleozoic seas. For many years, all scientists had were its teeth, arranged in a tight spiral, like a rolled-up saw blade. Where did that spiral go? On the snout? Inside the mouth? Curled beneath the jaw? Early reconstructions showed almost comical versions, with giant external saws protruding from the face. Later work revealed the truth. The tooth spiral sat inside the lower jaw, coiling backward. As the animal grew, new teeth formed on the outer edge of the spiral, while older ones were pushed inward. Helicoprian likely used this strange apparatus to slice soft-bodied prey like squid, its jaw working like a rotating cutter pulling food inward while shearing it apart. Why, across hundreds of millions of years, did the oceans keep producing giants and such bizarre designs? Part of the answer lies in the environment. At many points in Earth's past, the oceans were rich in oxygen and nutrients. Warm climates, widespread shallow seas, and booming ecosystems allowed some lineages to grow larger and larger. Gigantism brought advantages. Bigger animals could travel farther, control more territory, deter predators, and handle fluctuations in temperature or food supply more effectively. At the same time, prey species evolved thicker shells, faster escape responses, and more complex behaviors, pushing predators to become larger, faster, and more powerful in turn. This constant evolutionary arms race drove both sides to extremes. But there is a cost to being huge. Large animals need abundant food and relatively stable conditions. When environments change too rapidly, through climate shifts, volcanic activity, changes in sea level, or catastrophic events like asteroid impacts, giants are often among the first to vanish. Their very size, once a strength, becomes a weakness. Again and again, mass extinctions cut down the giants, only for new ones to rise later, built from the survivors. In today's oceans, the legacy of those ancient titans is everywhere. The streamlined shape of a great white shark, the deep diving endurance of a sperm whale, the filter feeding strategies of a blue whale, even the coiled shell of a nautilus, all echo ideas that life tested long ago. The players have changed, but the roles are familiar. Whales now fill the space once held by ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs. Sharks carry forward a predatory tradition that reaches back to before Dunkleosteus. Tiny plankton, coral reefs, and shoaling fish play parts first rehearsed in seas far older than Megalodon. 
There is, however, one crucial difference between the ancient world of sea giants and the modern one. Us. For most of Earth's history, mass extinctions were driven by natural forces, asteroid impacts, volcanic eruptions, shifts in climate and ocean chemistry. Today, the oceans face a new kind of pressure, overfishing, pollution, warming waters, and acidification driven by human activity. Creatures like sharks, which survived multiple past crises, are now in serious decline in many regions. Whales, once hunted near to extinction, still face threats from ship strikes, entanglement, and noise. When we look back at the immense, wild history of ocean life, the Eurypterid stalking mud flats, the armored bulk of Dunkleosteus, the elegant glide of Elasmosaurus, the savage strike of Mosasaurus, the impossible jaws of Helicoprion. It becomes clear that the ocean has always been a stage for power and fragility intertwined. Giants rise when conditions allow them, and they fall when those conditions vanish. Today, we are the ones changing those conditions faster than almost any event in the past. Yet there is also hope in this perspective. The very fact that life has repeatedly rebounded, reinvented itself, and produced new waves of giants shows how resilient the ocean can be, if given time and space to recover. Protecting modern marine ecosystems is more than just saving cool animals or charismatic giants. It is about respecting a story that has unfolded for half a billion years, a story in which we have suddenly become both witnesses and authors. So the next time someone mentions Megalodon as if it were the first and last word in sea monsters, you will know better. Long before that colossal shark ever opened its jaws, the oceans had already been ruled by scorpion-like arthropods, armored fish with scissor blade mouths, reptilian whales, long-necked ambush hunters, and lizard dragons that turned the Cretaceous seas into killing grounds. The ocean has never stopped producing giants, it has only changed their form. The forgotten titans still matter because they show us what the ocean is capable of and what it has endured. They remind us that power is temporary, but the sea endures. And as long as it does, the potential for new leviathans, new wonders, and new stories will always be there, waiting beneath the waves.